Now I want to talk briefly about malaria because this is a disease that, depending on the region, can either be considered an epidemic or an endemic disease. So we know worldwide malaria is, is fairly common. It occurs in uh, between 300 and 500 million persons per year, and the, but the majority of those cases are, are presenting in sub-Saharan Africa where malaria is essentially considered an endemic disease. However, if there were to be cases of malaria in the United States among uh, non-travelers, that is naturally locally occurring malaria, then we would have an epidemic of malaria here because again, it, it would be occurring at a level well above what we would normally expect. So now I want to define pandemic. Pandemic is otherwise referred to as a worldwide epidemic, but that isn't always the most correct way to define a pandemic. So there are, according to some, there are three essential conditions for a pandemic to occur. The first is when the new infectious agent that is presenting in the community occurs in humans who have otherwise no natural immunity to that disease. So a good example of this would be a new strain of influenza that may have evolved over time and is presenting in humans and for which there's no natural immunity to that strain of flu. The second condition for a pandemic is when the agent involved is capable of infecting and uh, sometimes killing humans very efficiently. And then the third condition is when they, that agent must succeed in being transferred from a human to a human. So in summary, it, it, in order for a pandemic to occur, uh, the, these three conditions have to, have to be met. Now, this isn't the definition of a pandemic necessarily, but this is, these are the conditions for one to occur. That is human to human transmission, <clears throat> an agent that is essentially new to that human population, and is also highly virulent and or confers significant morbidity. So you could think about several notable pandemics historically, um, bubonic plague, um, HIV AIDS, um, the Spanish influenza. Now, specific to flu or influenza, the WHO has specified six key phases. And why this, this is important is that because flu is itself a concerning problem every year because it can ultimately lead to a pandemic level disease and depending on the strain of the flu, can confer high morbidity and mortality as we've seen in the past. So I just wanna walk you through this to give you a sense as to how organizations such as the WHO, who are who for which is considered the the global public health leader looks at the different phases of a, of a pandemic and how um, those are classified. So the first phase is basically when you have no virus of that flu circulating among animals, um, nor, uh, nor have they infected humans. Okay, so there's essentially no virus circulating that's leading to infection. The second phase is when uh, there is animal flu virus uh, occurring and it's causing infection in humans at that point. The third is when there are small clusters of people with the disease. However, there's no evidence of human to human transmission occurring of that flu virus at that time. So in that phase three, it's the case that the human infections were occurring by animal exposure. And the fourth phase is when you have human to human transmission and that transmission is able to cause sustained community level outbreaks. So it is at the point of phase four that from a public health perspective is a major concern and requires immediate action. Phase five is when you have that continued human to human transmission and now it's in at least two countries in one of the WHO regions and WHO regions, by the way, are these geographic regions that WHO uses to uh, determine um, or consider spread of, of disease. 
And then finally, the sixth phase is when you have that human-to-human -human transmission. It's occurring in multiple countries, in multiple regions, and hence you have a global pandemic. So this just illustrates those six phases. And it again, it's at five phases five and six where you have a, a clear pandemic occurring and of, of greatest concern. Now, for those of us involved in public health efforts or specifically flu, you know, we are trying to avoid entering even that phase four, if at all possible. However, as we know, even in this current season, every season, there is circulating flu that leads to human to human, that's due to human to human transmission. But it is of a flu strain that we're used to seeing and for which we have <clears throat> the ability to vaccinate against. So when does an epidemic become a pandemic? Well, essentially a pandemic is not declared solely on the number of cases or the severity of the disease itself, but rather it's declared when there's world, uh, when there's a geographic distribution of that disease. That is, it's distributed in two or more regions of the world. I want to discuss briefly HIV AIDS as an example of a global pandemic. Specifically, that as we all know, HIV AIDS has been around since 1980s and it has affected humans in all regions of the world, such that no country is exempt from infection. So by definition, it, it, it in the beginning met the definition of a pandemic because of its geographic spread and the newness to the human population and its high level of virulence. As we know now, there are over 37 million persons living with HIV AIDS and annually back in 2004, this is a 2014 estimate, as, as many as 2 million new cases occurring per year globally. So it continues to be a pandemic, <clears throat> continue to be um, highly monitored and of great concern, despite the availability of highly active antiretroviral therapy. I want to talk now about the concept of herd immunity. And this is the idea that, <clears throat> that given a sufficient level of immunity to a particular disease in a population, you can ensure that all people in the population are immune to being attacked by that particular disease. So essentially, a large enough proportion of immune persons in a population will ultimately decrease or eliminate the likelihood that any person with disease will come into contact with a susceptible person. And from a public health perspective, <clears throat> the success of, of herd immunity via immunization programs depends upon both the rate in which the population is immunized, as well as how effective the immunization itself is, that is how, how the, well the vaccine works. But what's really important about herd immunity is that it's typically not the case that 100% of the at-risk population needs to be immunized. Again, given a sufficient level of immunization, that will confer uh, a level of uh, infectiousness that's too low to enable the ongoing spread of that disease. Now, unfortunately, we have seen in the recent past outbreaks of otherwise preventable diseases such as the measles, mumps, even rubella and the whooping cough in North America. And that is largely due to populations of, of people choosing against vaccination for their children. And in a few instances, it has also to have been associated with um, ineffective, vaccine, ineffective vaccine. But suffice it to say, this herd immunity and the concept has been around for years that has allowed us to essentially um, reduce the transmission of certain uh, infections that otherwise used to lead to severe morbidity and mortality in populations. One particular example comes to mind is polio. Polio continues to tr be transmitted across uh, different populations, not in the United States, but other populations. And the reason it doesn't occur in, in the United States anymore is because we have effectively immunized against it to the level that 
there's not enough circulating virus. And of course, there's the best example of a successful public health vaccination pro program, and that has to do with smallpox. So as described earlier, smallpox is a virus that has been around since back to 10,000 BC. And in the 20th century alone, it was known to have killed upwards of 500 million people. But in 1979, globally, public, smallpox was declared to be eradicated, and that was due to the success of global smallpox vaccination campaigns. And so it's considered the only human infectious disease to have ever been eradicated. Now, it is worth noting that there are vials of smallpox in existence today in specific, uh, very labor uh, government regulated laboratories. And a more, more concerning is that there are um, groups who are aimed at uh, hurting other populations who are involved in development of synthetic versions of smallpox. So there is a continued concern about biological use of smallpox, and hence there is continued development of treatment for smallpox infection if, uh, God forbid, there was to be a, um, a, back, a release of smallpox from a terrorism uh, perspective. <laughs>